very good evening to all the participants and uh, the panelists at the outset we thank and salute all the doctors across the globe who have been working selflessly during this pandemic time magra hill is glad to organize this webinar clinical winners in cardiology case review and discussion by the world class minds in medicine doctors from the editorial board of harrison principles of internal medicine thanks to our partner knowledge bridge for the support in organizing this for over 130 years magra hill have never stopped innovating to meet the ever changing needs of educators and learners and will continue to support and celebrate your efforts every step of the way magra hill thanks all the doctors who have taken time to attend this webinar i am glad to introduce our panelists with a brief introduction about them dr charles veena overseas johns hopkins medicines international enterprises developing sustainable innovative collaborations that raise the standard of healthcare around the world and providing personalized care for diverse population he is also a professor of medicine and physiology at the johns hopkins university school of medicine and affiliated faculty of the johns hopkins alex grass humanities institute he has earned recognition for his medical and academic leadership including a professor's teaching award and a george stewart award for clinical teaching from the johns hopkins university school of medicine he served as a chair of the committee that created the school of medicine genes to society curriculum and as director emeritus of the osler internal medicine training program the first us medical residency program dr veena is also an associate editor of the american journal of medicine and has authored the last four editions of the harrison's principles of internal medicine self assessment and board review from 1987 to 1991 he was a fellow in pulmonary and critical care medicine at johns hopkins he is board certified in internal medicine pulmonary medicine and critical care medicine warm welcome dr veena and our next panelist is dr brian houston he is an associate professor of medicine at the medical university of south carolina he is an advanced heart failure cardiologist and the medical director of the left ventricular assist device program he completed his internal medicine training a year as an assistant chief of service general cardiology fellowship and fellowship in advanced heart failure at johns hopkins hospital dr houston's clinical focus is on mechanical circulatory support cardiogenic shock and inflammatory cardiomyopathies including cardiac sarcoidosis His research interests include the hemodynamic effects of left ventricular assist device support, myocardial fibrosis, and circulatory effects of mechanical circulatory support. Very warm welcome, Dr. Houston. And Dr. Marshall couldn't attend this webinar due to an unexpected emergency and conveyed her wishes for this webinar. So I would now like to hand over this to Dr. Charles Weiner and Dr. Brian Houston to take this over. Over to you, Dr. Charles Weiner. Thank you very much, Pradeep, and it is truly an honor to be here uh, with many of you uh, whose faces I can't see, but we know that you're out there, and we're thrilled to join you. Um, the format for uh, this evening, and we appreciate you devoting your Saturday evening with us. Uh, the format for this evening will be uh, basically utilizing some of the uh, materials from the uh, Harrison self-assessment that Dr. Houston and I authored uh, uh, some year, a couple years ago, and we're going to use this as a framework for discussion. Dr. Houston, we're gonna start with some questions that'll all have answers. We're gonna ask you all to spend some time uh, try answering the questions, and then we'll go through one by one the answers. If you have questions, we ask you to put them in the Q&A, which I will be monitoring. And if we have time during the questions, we'll go to them. Otherwise, we'll try to save a few minutes at the end for general questions uh, that people can ask. So without further ado, let's start with question number one. And I'm going to read, I'll read to you the qu clinical vignette. Patient MC is a 77 year old woman with end stage renal disease on hemodialysis, and she, which she receives on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. She presents to the emergency department with dyspnea and fatigue on Wednesday morning after missing her last two dialysis sessions. An electrolyte abnormality is present. We're going to show you her ECG in just a moment. Um, and it's initially is in the mild to moderate. There it is right there. Um, 
as the, uh, go back, Brian. Uh, as the electrolyte abnormality worsens, free CG pr uh, progresses. Uh, and the question is going to be, which abnormality is most likely? Is it hypercalcemia, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, or hyponatremia? And I can see that one person already put in the chat, or a few people have already put in the chat, that they think that this is hyperkalemia. Um, actually, more people. Uh, Brian, uh, let's, why don't you let's take us through the cardiograms, Brian, and I'll, I'll give you the floor. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Charlie. And I want to thank uh, Pradeep as well for the warm welcome. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. So uh, we've got a savvy audience with us here, Charlie. They got about two seconds of this EKG, uh, and they knew the answer. And I think, um, you know, this they're right. So here you can see an electrocardiogram progressing from mild hyperkalemia to moderate to what would be recognized as life-threatening hyperkalemia. And you know, I like to start with this question uh, because this is an important clinical thing to recognize. And the electrocardiogram is crucial to recognizing how serious hyperkalemia can be. We see this often in our end-stage renal disease patients who forego dialysis. So if you look, we'll start with the middle here, the moderate, as it's easiest to recognize. There's two abnormalities to see. One is peaked T waves. And this is a pretty classic boards question. You see peaked T waves on an electrocardiogram. You wanna think hyperkalemia as an electrolyte abnormality. Of course, other things can cause it as well. Repolarization abnormalities from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you can see a hyperacute peaked T waves in ischemic disease. But here you also see the electrocardiogram progressing from normal atrioventricular conduction to a first degree heart block. Um, as you see prolongation from the P to the QRS. There are kind of two ways to think through the progression of electrocardiogram in hyperkalemia. One is the kind of simple mental heuristic of just thinking, uh, my, I remember when I was an intern, my residents taught me, just think of grabbing the T wave with your fingers and pulling up and all of the changes that can occur from that. So the T wave peaks, the QRS gets pulled with it and away from the P wave. And eventually the T wave and the QRS will just merge into one and become the sine wave ventricular non-contractile uh, activity that you see on the right. Uh, this is usually life-threatening, resulting in um, no circulatory uh, action. So again, here's the kind of bullet points for this question. It's crucial to recognize hyperkalemia. Uh, you have to recognize those peaked T waves in settings of hyperkalemia to know how to treat. Uh, and this gets us to kind of the second way to think through why you see those electrocardiograms. And it's because um, hyperkalemia causes slow conduction. And initially it's slow conduction between the myocytes, slow electrical conduction, causing repolarization abnormalities. And then that progresses to slowing conduction, both in the sinus node and the AV node, causing conduction abnormalities uh, in the P wave and between the P wave and the QRS. As conduction just completely slows, you get this um, uh, just sine wave activity. The way that you would treat this, first, you need to stabilize that conduction by giving calcium. You need to push the calcium uh, level up in the serum, and then you need to somehow get rid of the potassium. You can get rid of the potassium either intracellularly uh, by giving medications that might push it intracellularly, like uh, beta agonists such as albuterol or even insulin, uh, and then somehow get the body to evacuate the potassium, whether that's in the urine uh, with diuretics, uh, or with potassium binding resins uh, in the stool. So we can move on to question two uh, if you want, Charlie, unless well, you got some actually, questions. Well, go back one second and just uh, just briefly go through uh, it. Uh, the, the calcium was also mentioned in the question. And what are the, just very quickly, what are the changes that one will see in the ECG in, in hypocalcemia or hypercalcemia? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you see changes in, um, ST segment length, quite frankly. So in hypercalcemia, you'll see shortening of the ST segment uh, and vice versa. So it'll look like QT prolongation, but it's different than the typical QT prolongation we might see in something like okay. hypokalemia. Yeah. So hypokalemia, you'll get QT prolongation and you'll also see the presence of U waves, which is a positive deflection after the T wave. Now those can be present normally um, but hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia with QT prolongation, 
can lead to you know that life-threatening arrhythmia, which is torsades to point. Hypocalcemia can be a little bit differently, and it's predominantly because it's not the T wave that's changing, uh, it's the ST segment. Great. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's move on to our next question. Okay, so this is a 79-year-old man with a history of coronary artery disease, ischemic cardiomyopathy, who has a known left ventricular ejection fraction of 30%. He also has hypertension. He presents to your office for a no new complaints for a routine visit. When you examine him, you find that his blood pressure is 108 over 56. His heart rate is irregular at 88 and his oxygen saturation is 98%. I'll show you his rhythm strip in just a minute. Six months ago, his heart rate was regular and his ECG showed no abnormalities. So we're gonna look at the ECG, but then we're gonna say he now has a definite class one indication for which of the following therapies. And I think the therapies that are mentioned will give you an idea of what the ECG is gonna show. But so uh, we'll, we'll go through these quickly. We'll go to the ECG and then I'll come back to the options. Amiodarone, 400 milligrams daily. Aspirin, 325 milligrams daily. Flecainide, 600 milligrams as needed when he has palpitations. Systemic anticoagulation with warfarin or a novel oral anticoagulant. Or does he need a transesophageal, transesophageal echocardiogram followed by direct current cardioversion? So let's take a look at the uh, cardiogram, Brian. All right, okay, so we'll here get, you go. We're gonna let you all have a minute. And so the question is, do you wanna cardiovert this patient? Do you wanna give them anticoagulation? Do you wanna give them an antiarrhythmic? Do you wanna give them, uh, and we gave two antiarrhythmics as options, or do you wanna give aspirin? Go back to the ECG and let's see what folks say. All right, people are thinking about this one, Brian. We're not as quick yeah. a response. Oh, good. I was hoping to stump people a little bit. If we make it too easy, it's not, it's boring. So let's walk through the electrocardiogram first. So, you know, we, we like to read electrocardiograms in a formulaic way. And I've only given you one lead here. So some of that um, kind of very proscribed formulaic method will be out the window. Uh, but we're looking, you know, first at rate and rhythm. And I think what jumps off the page here is, is the rhythm. This is not a regular QRS that marches out. Uh, you also see um, fairly chaotic uh, atrial activity. Without further leads, it's hard to know whether this is atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation. But what you don't have normal sinus rhythm here. And one of those two rhythms is present, most likely atrial fibrillation, because you don't see completely organized uh, what we call flutter waves or F waves. So an I3 so you're is saying, a choice. Yep. So, we're, so we've decided this is now a patient with new onset atrial fibrillation, which he did not have six months ago. Exactly right. Yeah. So we know that his uh, EKG previously uh, showed no abnormalities. And so this is a patient who walks into your clinic. He's essentially asymptomatic. Uh, and he now has atrial fibrillation. And this is not uncommon. You know, many times we think of, you know, the onset of atrial fibrillation as immediately causing symptoms. But I would say it's maybe even a majority of my outpatients who don't notice when they go into atrial fibrillation. And that's why it can be so dangerous. And we'll get into, as we go through the treatment options, about why you need to recognize it. So, uh, Brian, I will say that most of our people uh, are, at, are saying we should start some amio uh, oral amiodarone, 400 milligrams daily. Uh, one or a couple people would like to do a cardio version. So uh, okay. let's, what, do you, what do you say here? Great. So, you know, I think there's a couple of, you need to think through kind of a decision tree with uh, really any supraventricular arrhythmia, but atrial fibrillation benefits perhaps most from a very organized way of thinking. So first you need to think, is the patient hemodynamically stable? Now this is a patient who walked into your clinic, they're asymptomatic. They are stable as can be. Um, if they're not, if this is a patient who shows up with very rapid ventricular response, for example, and hypotension, malperfusion in the emergency department, that's when um, urgent direct cardioversion is warranted. Uh, the saying that I was taught is unstable gets the cable. So if they're unstable, they, they get electricity. You next then to think about uh, rate versus rhythm control. And that means, are you gonna focus on slowing the heart rate down and perhaps not give them medications to try and get them in sinus rhythm? Uh, or do you wanna try and get them in sinus rhythm? 
Now, recent studies have caused a little more clinical equipoise, but early studies showed it was really no benefit to getting patients back into sinus rhythm if they were asymptomatic in their atrial fibrillation. As I mentioned, there are more recent studies looking at ablation techniques that are they're smaller studies, but published in heavy hitting journals like the Castle AF study that have shown perhaps some benefits to ablation, but I think the jury's still out there. But perhaps most importantly in atrial fibrillation, you need to think about stroke and thromboprophylaxis, and that's systemic anticoagulation. So this is a patient who has structural heart disease. They have ischemic cardiomyopathy and uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, and um, they have been in atrial fibrillation for an unknown period of time. So it's very possible that in that setting of stasis uh, in the atrium, that they have uh, formed clot. And to cardiovert them immediately without anticoagulation uh, would be contraindicated. So you need to, they have a class one indication for systemic anticoagulation. Now you can risk stratify patients in atrial fibrillation uh, based on their comorbidities. You can risk stratify them for risk of clot or uh, stroke, uh, and then to make a decision on systemic anticoagulation. And two scores that are widely used, I've listed here, the CHADS2 and the CHADS2 BASC score. Any score greater than one, warrant systemic anticoagulation. Uh, and this patient has a CHADS2 score of three. They have heart failure, hypertension, uh, and an age greater than 75, and therefore clearly warrant systemic anticoagulation. And warfarin or a novel anti uh, oral anticoagulant would be fine. So, right. Brian, so, Brian, so uh, I think the key points here are that, so the answer, go back, go back uh, to, to the question. So the answer here is going to be D, systemic anticoagulation with warfarin or a novel anticoagulant for the reason you said. And what's interesting is that, you know, I guess, given that his heart rate is already controlled, we're not even going to try to either medically cardiovert him or even do rate control given that he's so stable. I think that's a fascinating discussion. I think one one choice that's important to discuss here is also flecainide. I didn't touch on this. So the, choice C is what we would colloquially call the pill in the pocket approach. These are for patients who have symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. They know the minute they go into AFib, um, you can prescribe this dose of flecainide or a dose of flecainide and they can take it. Uh, and it's been shown in a New England Journal article that's effective, it can cardiovert them. Important caveats are they have to have low uh, stroke risk. They, they should not have elevated CHADS2 VASC scores and they can't have any structural heart disease. So um, if you look at the CAST trial, which is now an, an old trial, any patients with structural heart disease um, had an elevated risk of adverse outcomes on the Vaughn Williams class one antiarrhythmics of which flecainide is one. So that's a direct contraindication of this patient to flecainide. And when you say structural heart disease, you mean the fact that this guy has coronary artery disease? Coronary artery disease no and coronary. ischemic, yeah, and ischemic cardiomyopathy. I know colleagues who will even look at the echo and say if they, if they have any left ventricular hypertrophy, they're really out on the Vaughn Williams class one, though I think that's more of a, of a gray area. Great. Okay. Uh, we're making good progress here. That was a great discussion. All right. Good. Um, okay. So now uh, let's go to question three. I am. Uh, I appreciate the participation so far. We do not have any uh, questions at this point, but we'll see. Question three is, uh, and this is not going to be a clinical question. This is going to be, uh, well, it is sort of clinical, but this is going back to pathophysiology, folks, which we still believe in. From a pathophysiology perspective, all of the following are upregulated in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So it is patients with reduced ejection fraction and heart failure. So that is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Which of these uh, biochemical processes are upregulated? Yeah. Uh, angiotensin II, B-type natriuretic peptide, calcium uptake into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, norepinephrine, or tumor necrosis factor. And the reason we want to discuss this is we think all of these have really important uh, implications for how we approach uh, therapy with people with HEFREF. So um, I'm gonna, we're going to pause for a second and see what people think about this one. So remember, four of these are correct. There's only one wrong answer here. You're actually, try, I'm at, we're asking you, which of these things is not upregulated? A, B, C, D, or E? Yeah, this is one just, of those. 
one of those tricky accept questions, Charlie. Give folks just a minute. All right, Charlie, I see a C, a B, a C. I think that this right now we got 60% C's and 40% B's. Nobody's yeah. going for A or E or D. Okay. <laughs> We've All right. got a sharp, we've got a really sharp crowd here. So yeah, I, I like this question. It, it feels like it's a question that's just asking a memorization, but it's really not. It's drilling down into do you know the pathophysiology of of cardiomyopathy and heart failure. And really, you know, it's a lens through which we can look at the last 40 years of discovery in therapeutics development in heart failure. We're gonna take these one by one. I'll, I'll jump to the answer slide here in a second. Um, but um, angiotensin two, so this is really asking about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. What happens to that in heart failure? One way to think about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction it is just a giant trick that the heart plays on the rest of the body. So as the heart gets weaker and cardiac output and or stroke volume drops, the body becomes convinced uh, that it is dehydrated. It's being malperfused. And from an evolutionary perspective, uh, when the body is malperfused, it thinks, you know, a saber toothed tiger bit my leg off. I'm, I'm uh, dehydrated. I'm hypovolemic. And it uh, instigates all of these um, compensatory mechanisms uh, to treat, uh, to, to try and help that. When in reality, as one of the early physiologists uh, discussed back in the 70s, he said, in reality, the, the person is drowning in their own juices, is the quote. So angiotensin II, renin, aldosterone, they're all working to retain sodium to increase vascular tone. Uh, and as we all know, this is terrible for heart failure. And actually, uh, abrogating that system with ACE inhibitors, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, or the new kid on the block, the angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitor is highly beneficial. It took us until uh, the 80s to really discover that. Uh, B-type natriuretic peptide is a peptide that's released from the atrial ventricles in settings of stretch. So as the heart is volume overloaded, those myocytes undergo stretch and will release BNP is how we uh, have the eponym there. Uh, this is one of the uh, compensatory mechanisms that's actually good. It's actually salubrious. It helps your body get rid of sodium. Uh, and so one of the rare mechan compensatory mechanisms of heart failure that we like to try and augment. The answer is C, so calcium uptake into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is this um, organelle in the uh, myocytes that hold calcium. And when it comes time to contract, it releases this big dump of calcium into the myocyte uh, cytosol. Um, causing uh, those cross bridges to form between troponin and tropomycin and myosin uh, and causing contraction. Uh, in heart failure, uh, the reuptake of this calcium is, is kind of broken. Uh, enzymes that do this, such as circa SERCA, don't work as well. And it leads to uh, a calcium cytosolic overload uh, and poor contractility. Norepinephrine, uh, one of those compensatory mechanisms that's, that's not good. The whole sympathetic nervous system gets upregulated in heart failure. Again, thinking I'm hypovolemic, I need to increase vascular tone. And this causes an unfortunate kind of feedback leak to the heart. And then we also know that heart failure is a highly inflammatory process and cytokines such as tumor necrosis factor, IL-1, IL-6, they're all upregulated as well. So far, um, research into um, anti-inflammatory therapy in heart failure has not really panned out. We tried TNF alpha inhibitors and they actually weren't helpful and there was some signal that perhaps they were harmful, um, but it is an upregulated system. So this just says, that means everything I just said. So, and to aldosterone, uh, AVP, norepinephrine, all upregulated. And while they're initially helpful to try and increase um, cerebral perfusion pressure, they eventually are deleterious. Um, so, that's that. Cool. Um, that's great. Uh, and uh, so again, I think the important thing here is that understanding the mechanism of, of reduced perfusion uh, helps you understand which agents are better. Uh, Brian, a quick question. So far, um, the drugs that have been utilized to manipulate calcium metabolism in the heart, 
um, some of the some of the onotropes and stuff like that. They've not really panned out to be beneficial. Is that a true statement? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true, especially if you view it through the lens of long-term morbidity and mortality. So of course we have uh, beta agonists uh, such as dobutamine or dopamine, uh, which can increase um, you know, calcium concentration in the cytosol. And while they initially cause increased inotropy or contractile force in the heart, if you look at registry data uh, and uh, they, they cause uh, increased mortality long-term. Milrinone is a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor, which increases cyclic AMP, uh, which is that second messenger in that calcium system, uh, and also causes increase or is associated with increased mortality in the long-term. Now, there are some interesting inotropic agents on the horizon. Um, for example, we have sensitizers of that troponin, tropomyosin, myosin system that cause stronger cross bridges to form there and longer and stronger contractility without affecting cytosolic calcium. One such medicine is omacanthic macarbol. Uh, in early clinical trials, it looks promising. The later clinical trial, galactic heart failure, has some signal for benefit as well. So there is more on the inotropy front, but it looks like augmenting calcium uh, really doesn't help these patients. Great. Um, hey, Brian, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask, let's... Uh, I think we should, let's skip this question and maybe go yep. to the next one. Sounds great. Okay. Yeah, I think this is a, a fun question to talk about and change topics a little bit, sort of. Uh, so this is a young man, Mr. Jones, who presents the emergency room with several days of worsening shortness of breath and lethargy after, one week after a viral upper respiratory tract infection. Um, we're going to presume uh, Dr. Brian can tell us whether or not this may or may not have been COVID. But nevertheless... His family brought him in after he lacked the energy to get out of the couch. This is a 21-year-old boy. His blood pressure is 88 over 72. His heart rate is 115, and his room air saturation is 90%. Physical examination reveals crackles in his lungs, an elevated jugular venous pressure, an audible S3 gallop, and cool extremities. He's lethargic, slow to respond to questions, and laboratory analysis reveals that he's in new, presumably new onset uh, renal failure with a creatinine of 2.3. He has an elevated B-type natriuretic peptide, and he has a mildly elevated lactate. lactate. Bedside echocardiogram reveals a left ventricular ejection fraction of 15% with global hypokinesis. You start him on dobutamine um, and prepare to insert a PA catheter for hemodynamic monitoring. Before starting dobutamine, which of the following uh, we're talking about the hemodynamics of, of cardiogenic shock here, I, I guess. So uh, which of the following would be increased and should decrease with this therapy? Um, actually, this is not the question. I wanted to go to the next question, I think. Um, <laughs> do I, um, what, you want to go through this go one? Through I can go through this one quick. Yeah, so the options are which of the following, Given what is the dobutamine going to do? Is it going to increase... Um, uh, uh, which the which the the question is asking folks, you're going to start the dobutamine, but which of the following hemodynamic parameters is increased and will get better, decrease or decrease with therapy? And the answer is cardiac output, left ventricular stroke work index, mixed venous oxygen saturation, stroke volume, or systemic vascular resistance. So which of the following is increased before you start the treatment and will decrease with treatment? Again, another pathophysiology question. Let's go fast yeah. on this one, though, Brian. So I'll go quick. So really, you know, if you're a savvy test taker, you'll recognize that the first four choices are all kind of the same thing. Um, cardiac output, stroke work, um, how, how much is the heart doing during systole, uh, mixed venous oxygen saturation. So as the FIC principle teaches us, if, if mixed venous oxygen saturation, and that's the oxygen saturation in the pulmonary artery before the capillary bed, so if that goes down, it means cardiac output has also dropped in the setting of stable hemoglobin and oxygen consumption. If it goes up, cardiac output is increased. And then stroke volume. So these are all getting at what, uh, you know, what is the vitamin going to do to cardiac output? And it should increase it, right? So just as we just talked about, this is the beta agonist, increases calcium, causes increased stroke work, stroke volume, heart rate, everything should rise. Systemic vascular resistance in cardiogenic shock is often very high. And you can detect this on, uh, exam. The patient will have narrow pulse pressure, as this patient does. They'll have thready pulses, they'll be cold. And dobutamine has this uh, beautiful property that it can cause systemic vasodilation, and, and this helps the heart. It increases stroke volume, 
uh, by increasing contractility and aft load matching. Uh, so I essentially said all of that here, uh, but just knowing that in states of cardiogenic shock, SVR, systemic vascular resistance is high, that that's bad, and that starting a vasodilator or an inodilator like dibutamine uh, can be helpful acutely. Go on to, yeah, question six. Okay, uh, great. I th let's do this one. So yeah. this is a, this is, I, I, I got confused and I apologize. A uh, 22 year old college student with no past medical history was seen in the urgent care clinic three days ago for, again, kind of what sounds like a viral syndrome, coryza, myalgias, cough and fever. Um, and this was going through the campus. He was simply given uh, uh, kind of a symptomatic treatment and was told to stay hydrated. However, now, a couple days later, he presents the emergency department and he also has lethargy and fatigue. He's obtunded with a heart rate of 120, a blood pressure of 80 over 62. Again, his extremities are cool. His drug abuse pressure is elevated. He has an S3. He's got a murmur of mitral regurgitation. And we do a bedside echo and it shows no pericardial effusion, a non-dilated left ventricle, but an ejection fraction of 30% with mild mitral regurgitation. He gets, goes straight to the cath lab, I guess, and gets an endomyocardial biopsy, which shows lymphocytic myocarditis. So which we're talking about myocarditis, which of the following statements regarding this patient's prognosis and the implications for therapy are true. So his chance of survival, A, is his chance of survival is 10% without a cardiac transplant, and he should be emergency listed for a cardiac transplant. B, his chance of survival is 50% with many patients having full recovery in, F in LV function over the next weeks to months and he just merits aggressive pharmacologic and mechanical hemodynamic support right now. Option C is immunosuppression with high dose systemic steroids will increase his chance of survival. And D, the presence and titer of anti-heart antibodies can help provide prognostic information for this patient. So we're obviously talking about uh, the diagnosis and treatment of um, myocarditis. And so far we've got some Bs. I got to see a B, I see a C. Um, let's give folks one more minute because this is, I think, a, a relevant, important topic for cardiologists. By yeah, the way, Charlie, I want to thank I, the I want to thank the folks who are answering uh, for us in the chat. We, it, it's fun to look at those. Thank you very, very much. We appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for engaging. So this is, uh, I actually saw a patient just like this two weeks ago, Charlie, in the ICU, although I wrote this question uh, much before that. Uh, we see this is a more common than we like to think clinical scenario. So I, I, just a quick question to the side, like, do you think you saw more of this as a result of COVID or do you think, did COVID change this whatsoever? And, and then we'll talk about the answer. How did COVID yeah, impact I, this? No, it's such a hot question. And I think the jury's still out. I, I can tell you my personal experience and I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, what the literature has shown as the COVID pandemic has evolved here. So initially there was, you know, a great deal of consternation over COVID myocarditis. There were some MRI studies and some biomarker studies that showed in people that caught COVID, they were seeing more um, gadolinium enhancement on MRI, which is a sign of myocardial inflammation and increased troponin. That literature has been called a little into question as both of those ways of looking at the heart are just extremely sensitive ways of looking for you know, any myocyte damage. And if you do similar studies after other viral illnesses, you, you may see similar results. Anecdotally, I've seen very few cases where I was convinced it was COVID myocarditis. It's much more common for me to see, you know, very common respiratory illnesses, adenovirus, Coxsackie virus, rhinovirus, enterovirus, um, causing a lymphocytic myocarditis. Now, can COVID cause it? Absolutely. Uh, but so far, both from a, from a viral perspective and from a post-vaccine perspective, which has even been you know, much more rare as to be non-existent in my clinical experience, uh, we're not seeing, I, I haven't seen a ton of COVID myocarditis. Well, that's, thank goodness that's reassuring. So the consensus of our audience seems to be uh, start some steroids, Brian. Let's go. All right. So this is a this is a tricky one. So this is lymphocytic myocarditis. And I think there are kind of two um, ways to look at these answers. One is you're asking, we're asking about the prognosis and we're asking about treatment with choice C. 
So uh, this is what we call fulminant viral or lymphocytic myocarditis. And you have to be able to recognize this early because treatment does matter, but it's not the treatment that, we, that you might think. From a, um, intuitively, it makes sense. You have a lot of inflammatory infiltrate in the heart. You should start immunosuppression. That has not panned out in clinical trials. So whether you look at steroids, medicines like cyclosporin or azathioprine, uh, and do a prospective randomized clinical trial as have been done in the myocarditis treatment trial, in the TIMIC trial, uh, we have not seen benefit for immunosuppression. What's reassuring is that many of these patients, despite the fact showing up as sick as this patient was described, will improve if you can just support their circulation uh, through the acute injury. So these patients often require pharmacologic inotropes and even temporary mechanical circulatory support with a balloon pump, a percutaneous left ventricular assist device, or even as my case of uh, my patient from a couple of weeks ago, uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation to circulation or ECMO. Uh, the recovery time is usually on the order of days to a week or two, um, but um, they can recover fully. So again, this is lymphocytic myocarditis. There's no benefit to immunosuppression in these patients. Uh, the pediatric literature, I'll say as an aside, is a little different. Uh, if you have a child that has lymphocytic myocarditis, they have studies to show that there's benefit to IVIG, and this is not borne out in the adults. Uh, and then you have to support these patients uh, mechanically, but they can recover. Um, I think I have a slide. Yeah, so I mentioned the patient I had a couple of weeks ago, uh, and this is shared with permission. This is actually uh, her biopsy. I know many of you don't or may not look at endomyocardial biopsies, but uh, this is one that keeps a cardiologist up at night worrying. So the, the pink cells that you see that are kind of uh, strips, uh, those are myocytes and there aren't very many of them. This is supposed to be all pink cells, no blue. All of the blue cells are lymphocytes and you can see myocyte destruction and death. And it's just, you know, looking at a biopsy like this and seeing how the patient comes in, it's amazing to think they recover, but, but they can. So Brian, answer this two questions for me. So one question is, is, in what situation when you think you have somebody with acute myocarditis, might you consider steroids? Or, and the answer may be, I don't, not don't do steroids. And then the second question relates to option A here is, when do you think about getting this patient tuned up for cardiac transplant, a patient like mm -hmm. this for cardiac transplant? Yeah, so the, the first question, when should you do steroids or I'll broaden it to immunosuppression? And it has to do with uh, what the ultimate etiology of the myocarditis is. I don't want to say too much because I think I'll spoil our next question, but there are a couple of um, etiologies of myocarditis, eosinophilic myocarditis, giant cell myocarditis, and then in the transplant patient, transplant rejection. Uh, those benefit unequivocally from immunosuppression. Um, eosinophilic myocarditis, for instance, responds exquisitely to steroids. So you really need to get that biopsy to know that because you can't, there are no imaging techniques to help you differentiate giant cell from lymphocytic or eosinophilic from lymphocytic. And so endomyocardial biopsy is crucial. As to when to consider a patient for transplant, it also goes into the etiology. Some etiologies like lymphocytic have a high chance of recovery. And so we may not initiate a transplant workup on, you know, day one. Other etiologies have a very low chance of recovery. Uh, and we're going to be very quickly thinking about transplant. Now, we do have lymphocytics that, that don't recover. You, you have them on support and you're a week or two weeks in and, and they're not doing better. Um, that's when we would say, OK, we're, we're not going to get out of the woods on this one. We need to, we need to think about some sort of transplant or le a durable left ventricular assist device. Cool. Great. Um, okay, uh, you want to go to this one? Uh, okay, this patient has, uh, okay, uh, as you can yeah. tell, Dr. W w Dr. Houston loves cardiomyopathy, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about cardiomyopathy. Um, so we'll hit, yeah, so this, this is sort of a companion question to the last one, and we can go quickly through this one if you want. Okay, so this is a 42-year-old woman with a history of Hashi uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis who was treated with radioactive iodine some years ago. Now she presents the emergency department after passing out briefly at home. She reports lethargy and chest discomfort. She has, a, again, she's tachycardic at 120. She's hypotensive at 77 over 62. Her extremities are cool and she seems lethargic or sleepy. Her whole blood lactate is elevated 
and her urine output is diminished. On con cardiac monitor, she repeatedly has salvos of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. She also gets an echocardiogram and she has a left ventricular ejection fraction of 15%. And she also gets a bi emergent biopsy. This time it shows diffuse granulomatous lesions surrounded by extensive inflammatory infiltrate. So which of the following is true about her diagnosis? Um, and so most patients with this etiology of cardiomyopathy recover with supportive care. So again, this is different than our lymphocytic one. Steroids are highly effective in treating this form of cardiomyopathy. The course of this cardiomyopathy is dire with rapid deterioration requiring urgent transplant. While seen occasionally, ventricular tach uh, tachyarrhythmias are rare in this disease or are none of these options uh, correct? Um, Brian, let's just go right into this in the interest yeah, of time, though, okay? We'll jump into this. Yeah, so the, the first answer here, right, that's our previous patient, the lymphocytic uh, myocarditis. And I think that's why this is a companion to kind of highlight the differences. Uh, I'll jump to the kind of, I don't want to bury the lead. So this is a case of giant cell myocarditis. Um, you see those large granulomatous lesions, extensive inflammatory infiltrate, and, and that latter part is what's, what differentiates it from sarcoidosis, which also has granulomatous lesions, but typically a paucity of uh, perigranuloma inflammation. It's also the presentation that just kind of shouts giant cell myocarditis. This is acute shock in a previously healthy patient with arrhythmias, and this is the one that we, you know, you, your previous question of when would you think about transplant? This is a patient that as soon as I make the diagnosis, I start the transplant evaluation because the answer C is the, the right answer here. This cardiomyopathy, the course is very dire. Patients can deteriorate uh, in minutes to hours in front of you, either from a pump failure, uh, from a ventricular arrhythmia, uh, or from um, a conduction system disease perspective. The last patient I had with giant cell myocarditis was a month or two ago. Uh, and went on to ECMO, and right after we got uh, the patient on ECMO, they had nine minutes of asystole, and they fortunately survived because we were circulating, but that's how fast uh, this disease can deteriorate. While we do treat this disease with immunosuppression, uh, uh, it's not extremely effective. Uh, the one-year transplant-free survival in giant cell, even treated with immunosuppression, is just under 50% in studies. Uh, and so even if we start aggressive immunosuppression, we're going to concomitantly work this patient up to transplant. I think I've said all of that here. Yeah, it does have some associated conditions. So there was a little hint in there that she had Hashimoto's thyroiditis, other forms of autoimmune disease. It's sort of the company that giant cell can keep sometimes. So Brian, I'm going to propose that, uh, uh, go to question eight. So I'm going to propose for question eight, that we just continue um, the, the and, and we close the loop on our cardiomyopathy discussions <laughs> by not Sounds necessarily good. going through this question, but you mentioned cardiac sarcoid a couple times. Um, and, and folks, this question is about cardiac sarcoid, which we see are seeing a lot in the United States now. Um, and, and just close out the discussion with um, a little bit about cardiac sarcoid and also whether or not you want to mention Chagas or not. But uh, let's, let's close the loop on, let's close the loop on cardiac sarcoid because we are seeing more of it. And I think diagnostically it's, and therapeutically it's interesting. It is interesting. Yeah, I, I see a lot of this disease. Uh, my clinic trends, as you might guess from these questions, trends towards inflammatory cardiomyopathies. And cardiac sarcoid is just incredibly common. It's also terribly vexing because it's difficult to diagnose. So as noted in the question stem here, you know, it's the, the gold standard is a biopsy showing non-caseating granulomas, but biopsy is kind of miserably non-sensitive for sarcoid. I tell patients um, uh, an unguided, you know, just biopsy of the, of the interventricular septum has about a 25% sensitivity for sarcoid. So a negative biopsy is not that helpful for you. It is kind of hallmarked by three classical presentations. You can get ventricular arrhythmias, you can get heart failure, usually with reduced, but sometimes with preserved ejection fraction, and then you can get conduction system disease. If you look at all the patients who have non-cardiac sarcoidosis, 25% of them in autopsy studies will have cardiac involvement. So if you have sarcoid of your lung, of your skin, if you have neurosarcoid or uh, ocular sarcoid, uh, you have a one in four chance of having cardiac sarcoid. Only um, 20% of those, so 5% total of, of the cases are, are recognized clinically during the patient's lifetime. 
unfortunately, sometimes the presenting sign of cardiac sarcoidosis is sudden cardiac death uh, from ventricular arrhythmias. And so if you're seeing a patient with sarcoid, uh, you really have to have your, your ears perked up for any signs of um, cardiac involvement, whether it's palpitations or presyncope, an abnormal baseline EKG. And then the diagnostic uh, algorithm is complicated, but really hinges around what we call advanced imaging. Since the biopsy is pretty non-sensitive, you need to look with a cardiac MRI or a PET scan for either scar or inflammation in the heart. Great, and, and steroids work in this? Steroids do work. They're kind of what I tell people are the foundation of therapy. And then we, we build the house on the foundation. So initial therapy is usually steroids. I put up a slide here showing the, the kind of classic non-caseating granuloma. And you can see there's not a lot of inflammation around that. So yeah, so steroids work. We'll typically start a dose and taper and oftentimes adding steroid sparing agents over the top. The two best studied are uh, methotrexate and mycophenolate mofetil. Um, and sometimes we'll have to progress to biologic TNF alpha inhibitors such as infliximab, adalidumab. Yeah, and, and the only thing I would add, I think that's, this is great. And uh, I, again, I think one of the things we've talked about is that the importance of cardiac biopsies in some of these patients or other, if you suspect cardiac sarcoid, advanced imaging, PET or MRI. Uh, the other thing I'll say, that, and again, this is from my personal experience of a close friend, in patients with cardiac sarcoid who have um, uh, oh, no. symptomatic arrhythmias, um, they may need an AICD or something like that uh, until their sarcoid cools off, right, Brian? 100%. And even patients who present just primarily with conduction system disease, let's say they have you know, heart block um, and you think they need a pacemaker, if it's cardiac sarcoid, that should also include high voltage defibrillation capacity. So they need a defibrillator. Even patients who have an ejection fraction above our usual recommended cut point of 35%, if they have a lot of scar on their MRI defined by late gadolinium enhancement, uh, I advocate for a defibrillator and that's now in the guidelines. It's a reasonable thing to do. Great. Um, okay, folks, uh, your, your tour to heart failure is, is over. We're gonna do a little bit on physical examination uh, to close out here a little bit. And uh, here's an interesting case because we uh, uh, that I think this is a fun case for uh, an interesting uh, differential diagnosis. You are evaluating a 42 year old man with a history of syncope. So this guy's passed out already. You auscultate a systolic crescendo decrescendo murmur at the left lower sternal border. Yeah. Which physical examination maneuver and finding is most consistent with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy versus plain old aortic stenosis? And the options are A, the murmur gets louder with a Valsalva. Option B is the murmur gets louder with passive leg raise. Option C is it gets louder with squatting. D is it gets louder with a hand squeeze. Or option E is the murmur gets quieter with Valsalva. So again, we're trying to figure out which pain, whether or not this is, which of these is true in obstructive cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy versus plain old aortic stenosis. Basic physical examination stuff that we learned a long time ago. Give me like folks one minute. It's like patting myself on the back, Charlie, but I really like this question because it makes you think about your physical exam, know what happens with different maneuvers and also know about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy physiology. It's kind of a three layer question. And while, while people are answering, um, do you still do these maneuvers in your clinic or do you just go right to the echo? <laughs> no, at 100% do the maneuvers. Like, uh, I think the echo is only as good as the information that you're looking for. And so if, if I don't have a pretest probability, I'm going to be looking for the wrong thing or the, I'll tell the tech, you know, really investigate that aortic valve. I think this is AS and they'll miss the subaortic valve hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with outflow graph instruction, outflow tract instruction. Um, so you, I, I think the physical exam should should not be a lost art. You, you know, I'm kind of a disciple and a, a proselytizer of the physical exam. So, uh, and I think it helps you understand the patient's physiology. Um, I, look, I fully agree. And, uh, and, and I think cardiac examination is still one of the few places where actually it, it can actually really help you. Uh, for, for pulmonologists, we just listen for crackles or wheezes, but you guys have advanced stuff. Uh, okay, so, yeah. so far we have a C and we have an E. Uh, let's, let's, let, what is the answer here, Brian? 
Yeah, so this relies on kind of knowing the difference in what happens to hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with preload uh, and with afterload alterations. And you have to know what each maneuver does. So we'll run through the maneuvers first and then the changes you'd expect. So Valsalva maneuver is a preload reducing maneuver for the left ventricle. You're increasing intrathoracic pressure. You're compressing those pulmonic veins and reducing uh, venous return to the left heart. Passive leg raise is the opposite. You're taking volume out of the legs, putting it into the abdomen and thorax. So it's a preload increasing maneuver. Similarly squatting, you're reducing the distance between the legs and the heart. And so the heart gets more preload. Uh, and then hand squeeze is an afterload change maneuver. So you're, you're compressing those uh, arterioles uh, in the arms and the hands uh, and afterload those up. With let me just, uh, Brian, yeah. uh, wait, Brian, let me just, just uh, to remind folks that a Valsalva maneuver is uh, the, this, essentially the maneuver you do when, you're, when you're, uh, you're looking to defecate. So you're closing your glottis and you're pressing down and you're elevating your intrathoracic pressure. So it's the, uh, yeah, I just wanna make sure everybody knows what Valsalva is. Yeah, forced expiration against a closed glottis uh, is the definition. Yeah. Think, uh, think defecation, think defecation. Yep. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and the savvy test taker here will say, that, okay, I've got choice A, which is uh, murmur goes up with Valsalva, choice E, which is murmur goes down with Valsalva. Um, both can't be true or false. So one of those is the answer, uh, just from a test taking kind of tip perspective. Uh, and if you're looking for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, the choice is A. So as you reduce the preload to the left ventricle, uh, that uh, outflow tract gets smaller. It shrinks down in size uh, and the obstruction gets worse. And so the murmur will increase. Uh, aortic stenosis uh, will not have this. In fact, uh, the murmur will decrease a little bit uh, as you reduce preload to left ventricle and you move leftward on your starling curve. And this kind of helps give insight into how hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients can, can get clinically in trouble. So this is a guy who's already passed out and you might think, okay, I know if preload goes down on the left heart, the murmur goes up because that gradient gets worse. Uh, and that's how HCM patients get in trouble. They get dehydrated. Uh, they have a GI bleed. They go work out in the sun all day long. Uh, and they, they have that obstruction gets worse and worse and worse. And suddenly they pass out. And this can lead to malperfusion of the heart uh, because of coronary malperfusion, can lead to arrhythmias, uh, and sudden cardiac death. Um, so just if you just remember, if I increase preload, I improve or decrease that gradient across the outflow track, and the murmur will go down. If I decrease preload, that outflow gradient gets worse, and the murmur will uh, will augment. Uh, you'll kind of get you'll kind of get it for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy physical exam. Great. Uh, Brian, in the interest of time, we really only have time for one more question. Then we'll take. Some, if there are any questions that we have. So pick your favorite question that you want to finish Ooh, with and see. go to that. All right. Let's see. I'm going to show the answers here just because I think it's fun to, you know what? Charlie, let's do this one. Okay. So this is Mr. Jackson who's having an exercise stress test. Uh, again, we're going to be talking to physiology here, folks. As he exercises more, you know that his myocardium will require more oxygen. How does the normal non-diseased heart respond to meet its higher oxygen demand? And, and Brian's going to transition this into how the, 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 the dysfunctional heart does. So option A is that as you exercise, your increased myocardial extraction uh, with constant coronary blood flow, or as you exercise, do you increase your oxygen extraction from the ventricular chambers? Or as you exercise, do you get relative expansion of the diastolic time period, allowing more coronary flow, because remember that coronaries uh, get their flow during diastole. Do you get vasodilation of the epicardial coronary arteries leading to a decreased resistance and improved coronary <laughs> blood flow? Or do you get vasodilation of the intramyocardial coronary vessels leading to improved cardi coronary blood flow? So the question is what happens during exercise and it will extrapolate into the diseased heart? Um, go, Brian. I'm going to jump into it. Yeah. So I felt like I gave the, the coronary artery disease crowd a, a little bit of the short end of the stick. So I want to get to some coronary physiology. And this gets to, you know, how does the myocardium extract and use oxygen? 
uh, in the normal state and will help you understand what happens in cases of ischemic disease or coronary artery disease causing angina. If two things are important to know. Uh, one, even at the resting state, myocardial oxygen extraction is extremely high and efficient. If you look at uh, venous saturations from the coronary sinus, which is the venous return of the heart, uh, they'll be in the 30 or 40% with the patient just resting there. So it's not really possible for the myocardium to extract more oxygen from the blood uh, when demand rises. So if you can't extract more oxygen, you've got to get more blood flow. We also know uh, when patients exercise or um, uh, cardiac demand goes up, it's when the heart rate's going up. And so you're not expanding diastolic time. The diastolic time gets eaten up and gets shorter during tachycardic episodes. So you can't increase oxygen extraction from the blood. Oxygen ex extraction directly from ventricular chambers is negligible uh, and you don't expand diastolic time. So you've got to somehow get more flow to that myocardium. So now we're between D and E and it's do you vasodilate the epicardial coronaries or the intramyocardial? And the answer is E, you vasodilate the intramyocardial coronary vessels. Resistance from the epicardial coronary vessels is in, in health is negligible. They're, they don't have a lot of resistance but those intramyocardial vessels is what provides most of the resistance. And by regulating that, you regulate coronary blood flow. Now contrast that to states of coronary artery disease where you have epicardial coronary stenosis and the heart tries to increase blood flow. It'll vasodilate those intramyocardial coronary vessels, but upstream of them, they're stenosis. They, they can't get any more flow. So the patient will, there'll be oxygen supply demand mismatch and they'll experience angina. I think I said all of that and, <laughs> and that's and, and that's why we put in stents. That's why we put in stents. Now, if you start to look at the clinical uh, data for patients with stable coronary disease, meaning they have uh, stable angina when exercising, there might not be much benefit to that. But if you have unstable angina, you're starting to have uh, oxygen supply, uh, supply and demand mismatch at rest or with in, uh, diminishing uh, exercise um, requirements, uh, then uh, revascularization with percutaneous coronary uh, intervention or uh, bypass surgery can be beneficial. Okay, thank you. Hey, Brian, why don't you unshare your screen? Um, and before we, we turn it back over to Pradeep to close this out, uh, I want to thank all, again, all of the participants who joined us today, the people who answered in the chat. Um, so far, we do not have any questions, but if we want to open, uh, if there are any questions, listen. And I promise you all, if we do this again, if we get invited back, we'll spend more time on coronary artery disease and not spend uh, as much time on car because I think we've thoroughly covered cardiomyopathy today. Um, uh, Pradeep, uh, can I turn it back over to you or should we? Uh, at this point, I don't see any questions in the question answer thing and I don't see any in the chat right now. Um, but I see, uh, uh, again, and it looks like people are starting to drop off because the hour is late for you in India. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Charles Wiener and Dr. Brian Houston. It was a wonderful session. And I'm sincerely, uh, you know, I believe that all the participants would have benefited uh, from whatever they have gained and that they, by attending this webinar. And we will be more than happy to invite you again for such uh, you know, webinars for especially cardiologists and these set of doctors. Maybe this is Saturday evening and, uh, you know, people are, and it's a bit late. Now it is around 8 p.m. in India, which is almost, uh, you know, the end of the day kind of thing. So we will just uh, plan another uh, webinar yeah. with you uh, both again at an opportune date and uh, time. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much for all the participants for taking out time and uh, attending this webinar. If you have any question, please do feel free. This is the last second which you have <laughs> in case if you have anything, yeah. Or else it will be maybe maybe we will wait for thirty seconds, doctors, and then we'll close this off. Hmm? Uh, and again, on behalf of uh, Brian and myself, uh, thanks to everybody, and thanks for your engagement, your participation, and thanks to Pradeep and the uh, the Harrison's folks, McGraw Hill, uh, and and our sponsors for organizing this. And uh, hope and hopefully we'll look forward to seeing you all uh, again sometime. I would like to point out that this is the Johns Hopkins Hospital in my background where uh, Dr. Houston and I met and we became close colleagues and friends. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, Pradeep, thank you very much. I think uh, we'll say good night and let you all have your dinner. It's dinner time for you. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. So nice of you, Dr. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. bye, -bye.